Welcome to the uh, Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles Urban Lecture Series at Loyola Marymount University. This is the 10th anniversary of the lecture, lecture series. We take a look at all kinds of contemporary issues facing Los Angeles, and we have people, analysts uh, from the uh, private, public, and non-sector, uh, non-profit sector of Los Angeles to comment on, on contemporary issues. Also in the audience, we have a student from Loyola Marymount University and some members of the community, uh, and faculty and staff, of course. Um, I am honored to have uh, several guests who are very prominent analysts in, in Los Angeles. Uh, immediately to my left is an old friend. Um, well, he is old, but he's also been a longtime friend. Uh, Rafe Sonenschein is a professor of political science of, uh, uh, and public administration at Cal State University Fullerton. He received his BA in public policy from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public uh, Public and International Affairs at Princeton University and his MA and PhD at, uh, uh, in political science from Yale University. Uh, he couldn't get into Loyola Marymount, so he had to go elsewhere. Uh, he, he has written extensively on the relationship among racial and ethnic groups and on the governance of American City. His book, Politics in Black and White, Race and Power in Los Angeles by Uni uh, Princeton University Press in 1993 received the 1994 uh, Ralph J. Bunch Award from the American Political Science Association as the best political science book of the year on the subject of racial and ethnic pluralism. Dr. Sonenschein is not only an academic, but he's also a practitioner. He served as the executive director of the City of Los Angeles Appointed Charter Reform Commission. Uh, for those in my class, I know we've been talking about charter. A uh, charter for a city is literally the constitution of the city. And when the city redid its constitution, uh, Professor Sonenschein was the executive director between 1997 and 1999. Uh, part of that new constitution incorporated the idea of neighborhood councils and also had a sunset clause within that for them to be reviewed. So in 2006, uh, Professor Sonenschein was named executive director of the Los Angeles Neighborhood Council Review Commission to examine the system that was set up in 1999. A, a teacher, a scholar, a practitioner, a community activist, Dr. Rafe Sonenschein. Next to him is my favorite conservative, because he takes my phone calls, is uh, Joel Fox. He operates Joel Fox Consulting, which is a public affairs and political consulting firm. He also currently serves as president of the Small Business Action Committee, which was founded in 2003 and battles for small businesses on important political issues. Prior to starting his own firm in January of 1999, Joel Fox worked for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association for 19 years, serving as the associate's president from 1986 <coughs> to 1998. Howard Jarvis is probably one of the most iconic names in California politics. People either hate him or love him, the association, and that goes for Joel Fox as well. Um, Joel Fox is co-publisher and editor-in-chief of the website Fox and Hounds Daily which offers commentary and news on California business and politics. It's one of my favorite websites to take a look in terms of opinion about what's happening in the politics of both Los Angeles and California. In 2010, Campaigns and Elections Magazine, one of the foremost magazines about practical politics, placed Joel Fox on the list of the top 100 players in California politics today. Over the years, Mr. Fox has taken a key role in many statewide and local ballot proposition campaigns. He has authored hundreds of opinion articles. You'll oftentimes see his name in the LA Times, the uh, D uh, Daily Breeze, the Daily News, and all kinds of newspapers up and down the state of California. Uh, Mr. Fox has written uh, several books, including The Legend of Proposition 30, 13, excuse me, The Legend of Proposition 13, which was published in 2003. He wrote a chapter in an anthology, After the Tax Revolt, a book that I used in class from the University of California Press. He also wrote an essay, which doesn't go with everything else, in the Baseball Hall of Fame sponsored book, What Baseball Means to Me. And we'll have to ask him about that, because I don't think you played baseball, did you? No, I was a runner, actually. Okay. I ran the Boston Marathon a few years, 1969 and 1970. 
Oh, besides running the Boston what? Marathon and, <laughs> and writing political books and a book about baseball, he also wrote a, uh, a novel, Lincoln's Hand, A Mystery Suspense, which was published in the summer of 2010. So you can see he's a, uh, a man of quite a few traits. Uh, in addition to that, he's served on many statewide commissions, too many to uh, uh, mention here, but just to mention that he's been appointed by both Republican governors and Democratic speakers to be on these commissions because of the voice and the uh, perspective that he represents. He's also a senior policy consultant for the Schwarzenegger for Governor campaign during the historic recall of 2003. He was a policy director for Richard Reardon for governor in 2001 um, and state co-chairman for the John McCain for president in 2000. So he's not always a winner, obviously, especially when you're backing Republicans in California. I can show you the scars. <laughs> and he, finally, he has served as a research associate at the Rose Institute of State and Local Government at Claremont, Claremont McKenna College, one of the best uh, local uh, public policy centers in, in Southern California. He was on the advisory council of the Public Policy Institute of California, probably one of the best research centers in the state of California, and was a member of, uh, excuse me, he's also been uh, part of the in Initiative and Referendum Institute at USC, and he's also an adjunct professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy in, at Pepperdine University. So you can see he's been very uh, knowledgeable and successful until that last part at Pepperdine University. Finally, Mr. Larry Cosmont. Uh, Larry Cosmont is uh, president and CEO of Cosmont Companies, which was founded in 1986. He is managing partner of Renaissance Community Fund, which invests and develops mixed used residential and commercial projects throughout California. In 2009, Mr. Cosmont uh, created the Cosmont Muni Horizon Funds, a proprietary source of private financing for public projects P3 initiatives, which we'll talk about, infrastructure funding and economic development. He's had a 36-year career encompassing negotiating developments and management of real estate transaction exceeding over $10 billion, mostly in California. He has an extensive track record as a public-private real estate consultant and developer with expertise in creating and managing real estate transactions. He has assisted hundreds of local government agencies in uh, land development policy decisions ranging from large-scale economic development to site-specific real estate strategies and projects. He has guided over 1,000 private sector uh, projects, obtaining public approvals, structuring deal terms, and securing financing. From 1975 to 1986, Mr. Cosmont served in the role as a city manager, director of community development, and redevelopment director in the cities of Santa Monica, Seal Beach, Bell Gardens and Burbank. He is now, uh, in 1995, he conceived of and has created and has become incredibly influential the Cosmont Rose Institute Cost of Doing Business Survey. Um, this survey covers over 400 cities in all 50 states and is published annually by the California's Claremont McKenna College. In 1996, Mr. Cosmont was named Service Professional of the Year by the Los Angeles Business Journal. Mr. Cosmont has served as uh, on State Commissioner of California Economic Development Commission and many other commissions, both for the city and the state. Again, too many to, to mention. Uh, Mr. Larry Cosmont. These three individuals have a lot of experience in terms of politics and practicality and in terms of what's going on both in California and in the city of Los Angeles. So we're going to start off with Mr. Rafe Sonenshine and basically ask him what is going on? What's going on with the city of Los Angeles? How did this new charter that basically he helped uh, uh, structure uh, help us deal with the current budget crisis and the state uh, uh, local relationships and uh, the uh, situation that Los Angeles faces itself in today. Uh, Ray. Important. Uh, nothing is as important as surviving this terrible budget crisis. The federal government has a budget crisis, but it's not really a crisis because they don't have to balance their budget. The state of California has a huge budget crisis, and that does impact the city. But these cities, not just LA, are desperate to find the money to pay for basic services. One of the great achievements of the charter reform was to tell you who's to blame for this. Uh, because before the charter, it was unclear who ran Los Angeles, who governed Los Angeles. The charter clarified that the mayor is ultimately responsible. 
And that's really the story of LA government today, is for better or worse, the mayor gets much more credit for what goes right and much more blame for what goes wrong. And in a way, that's the story of the Villaraigosa administration right now, is there been a lot of successes and problems, and those now get lodged in the mayor's office very much. If I were the mayor of a city right now, I would feel like these are awful times to be a mayor, although there's never really a bad time to be a mayor because it's such a great job. But the fact is they have to decide between parks, between police, between fire services, uh, whether to charge more for fees. Nowadays, if you get a parking ticket, it's going to be more. Uh, if you get arrested for speeding, the police officer will look very happy because you're helping to maintain the budget. The cost of everything is going way up. And then people are reading the newspaper about places like Bell, California, and deciding that they're all a bunch of thieves, which is not true. In Bell, they're a bunch of thieves. Uh, really, it's a city that was operated by criminals, essentially. But it's really a pretty unusual case in local government. People at the local level in Los Angeles are feeling besieged. Uh, city employees have furloughs. They have, which I know as a professor, furloughs are a very painful thing because you don't get paid for your furlough time. Uh, they're attacked uh, as if. Oh, but, uh, to, for the student, a furlough is basically an unpaid vacation. An unpaid vacation, not the best kind of vacation to take. Uh, you're attacked as public employees nowadays. There's a tendency to blame all the problems on public employees, at least right up until you call 911 and actually want the public employee to come and help you out. Then you like them quite a bit more. They're feeling very besieged. But within that, the city of L.A. is hanging on. It's hanging on by its fingernails, but it's hanging on. <clears throat> the police department, one of the untold stories of the last 10 years, has turned around from a hated department in minority communities with not enough officers to a much better regarded department uh, that's close to 10,000 officers. And, and the first part, I think, was due to the previous mayor, Jim Hahn, who made a major change that cost him the mayoralty in terms of who was the chief. Um, but the rest of it, I think Viragosa gets credit for reaching and sticking to the 10,000 police officer role. We gave him the sense with the charter that the mayor could take that strong position in order to do that. But you could also see how that power comes back and haunts the mayor. The Department of Water and Power is tremendously unpopular in the city of Los Angeles, and I would say that's for very good reason. It's an arrogant, uncontrolled department. Uh, when I was in the Charter Commission, my office was in the <coughs> DWP, and I felt like I was in an empire that was separate from the city government, even though it's really part of the city government. When they tried to raise utility rates, that was tied pretty directly to Mayor Viragosa, and that criticism, in my view, was correct because he was sort of involved in what hadn't been very good decision making about that. So the story of LA now is that the mayor takes more credit than before and takes much more heat than before. Within that, and I don't want to use up too much time because I know Fernando likes to ask snarky questions and, and I don't want to take any time away from, from those questions. I've been examining the Viragosa years quite a bit. I, I don't share the kind of disdain that a lot of people feel toward the Viragosa mayoralty. I actually think he's been a pretty successful mayor. I also think that it's in the nature of Los Angeles politics, though, that a mayor like Viragosa will have trouble being seen as a successful mayor because there's almost no media coverage of City Hall in Los Angeles, uh, except when it becomes celebrity coverage. And one of the arguments I've made is that most voters, what they know about Mayor Villaraigosa is that they saw that he was at the Lakers game, uh, they saw him at a, at a celebrity event, or they heard that he had an affair. These are all very coverable events. They don't know much about how the police department has been much more successful, and they mostly don't know that he's proposed, in my view, what might be the most creative transportation program anywhere in the United States, which is called the 3010 program that some of you may have heard of, he managed to get the LA County voters uh, who don't like to pay taxes um, to vote 68% to pay money for mass transportation. And then he's trying to leverage that for a federal loan to be able to spend the money now and then pay it back over 30 years. And even Republicans in Congress 
are showing interest in what he's going to do because he's actually bringing the private sector more into the proposal now. If he pulls that off, that will be copied by every mayor in the United States, and it will be a major stimulus program. That being said, if I were advising Mayor of Iragosa, I would say don't go to the Laker game. I mean, the reality of they're, Los They're Angeles, losing right now anyway. So they, they, they're not playing very well anyway. Can you go to a Clipper game, though? Well, there's a limit. Um, <laughs> the reality of it is, if you want people to know what you're doing, you have to make sure that's what they see you doing. You can't come back later and say, how come people didn't know I did this if all they see is you doing that? The mayor of New York City, by contrast, can go to the Yankee games, uh, they can have affairs, they can run around like crazy, but there's three or four newspapers every day telling you what they're doing as mayor. In fact, just to finish up, Mayor Giuliani in New York City, who's, for these days, reasons that are beyond me, considered an expert on terrorism, um, was thrown out of the mayor's mansion by his wife because um, he announced that he and his wife were getting separated on local TV without informing her of the impending separation threw him out and he spent the rest of his mayoralty living as a tenant in a friend's apartment house. Now I'd say that's a pretty damaging story, but there was enough coverage of him as mayor that people were able to see what he did as mayor. So I guess I would wish some of that on Mayor Viragoso, although some of that I think is in his own control. Um, the 3010 plan for transportation that Professor Sonenshine talked about, um, I don't want to spend too much time on it because next week we're actually going to talk quite a bit about it. We have. Uh, uh, several members of the MTA board coming to, to, uh, to talk to us about us. Uh, Joel Fox, um, part of the problem many think is the lack of revenue for the uh, city of Los Angeles and the state of California, and f the lack of revenue is oftentimes blamed on Proposition 13. Um, what is Proposition 13? Why do so many people hate it? And uh, how long is it uh, going to continue to, quote unquote, haunt uh, the uh, public policy of the state? Let, let, me, uh, let me start with a, a question for our audience. Um, I'd like to know what kind of knowledge you have about Proposition 13. <coughs> um, how many of you have heard of Proposition 13? Okay. How many of you have heard that it's a bad thing, hurting government? And how many have you, heard, have you heard that it's a good thing, that it saved people homes? Gentlemen up here, raise your hand on all, all three questions. So you, you get the picture. That's exactly what's going on. It has been considered by some <clears throat> that it has deprived revenue uh, to local government uh, and in turn affected the state government, uh, and I'll explain that in a moment, and by others uh, that it has protected the property taxpayer from losing their homes. A little history here. Proposition 13 was passed as a voter initiative in 1978. It's 33 years ago, before I would imagine all of you were born. And uh, it was in response to a escalating property tax, which was, be which was in the minds of many out of control because people couldn't pay their property taxes. Property taxes were based, back in those days, on the value of the home and times the tax rate. And the tax rate was set by the governing bodies. The city would say we need this much to run the city. The schools said we would need this much to run the cities. The Board of Supervisors, the county body, would put it all together and come up with a tax rate, which was, uh, on the average, around the state of California. It was different in every county, but it was about two and, two and three quarters percent of the value of the home. But at that time in California, home, property values were increasing dramatically. So taxpayers could face an increase of 50% in their property taxes in one year, even more because in large counties like Los Angeles, because the county was so big, the assessor, whose job it is to value the home, couldn't cover a whole county of Los Angeles in one year. Take them five years to get around the entire county. So you may not have been reassessed over a five-year period, and all of a sudden, if inflation had hit every year over those five years, you could see a tax increase of 100%. And a lot of people, particularly seniors uh, living on fixed incomes, were th there was a threat of losing their homes. Some actually did lose their homes. Uh, the government body did not react to this. There were attempts to do it. There were bills introduced in the legislature to control property taxes. Uh, but 
Nothing really moved ahead. By the way, the governor at the time was a fellow by the name of Jerry Brown. You might have heard of him. And uh, he is coming full circle now to face what occurred not only because of the Proposition 13 tax revolt, but what happened afterwards. <clears throat> the voters of California in 1978 decided enough was enough. Um, Howard Jarvis, who uh, I worked for, and uh, whose organization I ran after he passed away in the mid-'80s, and a fellow by the name of Paul Gann put a ballot measure uh, on the ballot, and it limited property taxes to 1% of the property value, and it could only increase 2% a year. So if there was raging inflation, it still could only go up 2% a year. Uh, the people passed it by 2 to 1. Uh, overwhelmingly passed uh, the measure and put it in place. At that time, that cut property taxes to local government by about $7 billion, about two-thirds, a lot of money, particularly back in those days. The state of California had a huge surplus. I know that sounds strange to any of you who may have been following the state of California over the last number of years, but at that time, money was flowing into the state and it was a huge surplus. In fact, the treasurer of the state at the time called it an obscene surplus. So Governor Brown decided that he was going to prevent any big cuts on local government level and help bring state money down to local governments um, to um, uh, make up for the lost property tax revenue. So the state became involved in local government uh, funding. And what you're hearing today, when you hear Governor Brown talk about the realignment, is to try to get local governments back on its own feet, stop relying on the state, yet he's still talking about taking, and I don't want to get too involved with this redevelopment stuff, but still taking money that is used locally, um, and the locals are upset with the governor's plan. So that's just a, a, a background, I think, covered. So, so Proposition 13 cut property taxes, and therefore the local governments had a, were going to have to cut services. The state stepped in and gave them money and then continues to give them money. Now it has a deficit in saying, we can't give you any more money, right. so now we're going to take that, some of that money back. So, and they've, in fact, over the years, have borrowed money from local uh, pots of money uh, over the years. So that's, that's part of the discussion that you're going to be witnessing this year and maybe for a couple of more years. Um, I, I guess let me just conclude by answering your question, Fernando, how long will this go on? Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, there have been complaints about Proposition 13 from the day it passed. And there have been organized efforts to try to make dramatic changes to it. It has been changed around the edges. The heart and soul of it, the 1% cap on taxes, the 2% increase, the fact that you need a two-thirds vote to raise taxes in the legislature, that was part of Prop 13, two-thirds vote for, uh, for the people to pass special taxes on the local level. If you want to raise taxes specifically for police, you need a two-thirds. If you want to raise a general tax, you just need a majority vote. All part of Prop 13. The heart and soul of it, those major pieces still exist. There will be efforts to try to change it. Uh, I, I, I predict you'll probably see a ballot initiative in 2012 to try to make some changes around the edges. But the problem that the legislators have, and, and those who want to change it have, is it's still a very popular measure with the people. Poll after poll still shows it with about a two to one margin. Now there's a larger undecided because a lot of people don't remember 1978. Population age is changing, but they don't. I think the reason it's still has such strong support as if you look at the polling on is the legislature doing a good job and it's always down at 12 percent or 10 percent I don't think the people trust whatever change might come along because they don't think it will be to their advantage and that as taxpayers they would be put in jeopardy so I think uh, that the taxpayer protections are going to be around for a while longer. So many people talk about about the unintended consequences of Proposition 13. What are some that you didn't foresee happening? Well, I think the main one is, um, and, and I, the, I will tell you that I have a little bit of a disagreement with some of the folks I used to work with on the taxpayer association side, uh, but there has been a shift of power to Sacramento uh, because, and, and this was not the intent of Jarvis and Gann, but there was a provision in Prop 13 that said the taxes should be apportioned according to law. Well, who makes the law? It's the people up in Sacramento. They can, make, they can make the law, they can override 
what you do here locally. And so they can decide how these taxes are split and move them around and, and uh, not to complicate matters, but when Prop 98 came along 10 years later to guarantee certain funding for schools, K through uh, 14, K through 12, and community college schools, um, then the state was on the hook and sometimes uh, some of the governors and legislators decided to move property taxes around uh, to help their budgets and deal with the school budgets. So uh, there was a shift of power to Sacramento that was, I believe, an unintended consequence of Prop 13. And that's one of the things that Governor Brown is trying to look at to see if he can shift the power back to local government. And then if you had the opportunity to reform Proposition 13, maybe around the edges, what reform would you like to see? I mean, that's the reform I just mentioned. Um, I think the governor's probably on the right track, uh, but you don't really need, uh, the legislature could do it on their own. They won't because they, they'd have to give up power, but um, they could statutorily make some changes on how the money is, is uh, delivered to the local level. Um, I, um, I am not in the camp to tax business properties more, which is one of the things that I think we'll see on the ballot mm -hmm. sooner than later. I don't think that's a good idea. I think it'll hurt the economy, hurt jobs, and a lot of reasons. And I think that the homeowners still want their protections uh, from uh, inflation, which hits California markets every once in a while, and from um, uncertainty of taxpayers. And remember, <coughs> unlike sales taxes, which you can control by buying something or not buying something. Our income taxes, which are judged by how much you make, if property taxes are based on the value of the property, which you can't change if the value goes up, you're not controlling that. It, it's, a, it's a tax on your wealth that you have no control over, and you may not have the income to keep up with it. So it's a, it's a property tax is a tax that a lot of people don't like, and they like the fact that it has some controls on it. Uh, Larry Cosma, you've been involved with a lot of these type of issues, including redevelopment. Before I get to that, I want to talk to you about the Cosmont uh, Doing Business Survey, which oftentimes talks about taxes and oftentimes is used against the city of Los Angeles because the city of Los Angeles actually always uh, scores very low or high depending on how you calibrate it and, and uh, people talking about there's just too much taxes in the city of Los Angeles. Talk, uh, explain to the students what the survey is, how you do it, and how it, the impact that it has. Sure. Um, let's see, I was a 26-year-old uh, city manager in 1978 when uh, <clears throat> Prop 13 really changed how cities did business. Uh, and Joel was right. I'll get to the survey because it works well. The reason I did the survey is because of the uh, need to gauge how cities are competitive. And it, it stems back to a platform that I, be, I think began with Prop 13 that is often not seen by many of the people in the industry. You know, when you were, if you were a city manager in 1977, you showed up one month in the year and you said, I need a million more dollars to make my city work. And you basically divided that amount by the amount of property taxes you got and threw that number into a rate and increased it and balanced your budget. Now, Look, I love that concept if you're a city manager because basically you don't have to work for a living. Uh, you know, you should, we should mention that the city manager is like the CEO of the city. Correct. So the city council hires this individual to run the city on their behalf. So when, you know, uh, Howard and Joel and Paul put Prop 13 on the ballot, I was an assistant city manager in Seal Beach at the time, we all thought this was the end of life because how could a city actually not have a place where it could go equalize its roles and provide the services every year. Well, it passed. And uh, Jerry Brown at the time did his best to backfill some services using the state revenue. But at the end of the day, a whole bunch of city managers retired because cities needed to become entrepreneurial. And these folks had never done that in their life. So they entered a new young Turk revolution of city managers who are getting ready to tire, retire today, who really were set with the prospect of still having to provide the same service without the reliability of being able to poach the taxpayer for money. So what did they do? They went into the business of economic development, and they went into the business of redevelopment, and they started to entice sales tax generators like Costco's and Target's and they started to provide subsidies to developer-invested transactions 
and do what we call these public-private deals. And a whole industry, which our company is very much a leader in, grew up in California and throughout but, the United States. But you want the Costco's and the Home Depot's because... They generate sales tax, which allows that city to backfill the amount of money they no longer could get from simply raising property taxes. So it puts cities in the real estate business, which, by the way, they're in today. Cities are still in the real estate business in a very big way, which is why Jerry Brown's proposal to eliminate redevelopment is particularly hard, you know, hard hitting. We'll get back to that, I'm sure. So the survey, after I left city management, I'd been in city management for 13 years, I left to start Cosmon Companies in 86. And our objective has been uh, to provide public-private real estate services to both sides, allowing them to figure out how to use private investment, public leverage, to bring on economic development projects to communities, improve the quality of life, generate taxes and jobs, and move forward without having to poach the property tax bill or other, other tariffs on local taxes, which, by the way, has happened anyway. Um, in that process of growing Cosmont, uh, one of the ways that, one of the questions that would often get asked by private investment was, you know, which community is the best to invest in? Um, so we figured out a formula that oh, basically... The best to invest for them to make money. Yeah, well, no, or to have a facility that allowed them to, to uh, manufacture a product where they could recruit, recruit good employees, because it's always not about, uh, you know, making money in every real estate decision for a company. Real, companies tend to make decisions mostly about providing products and services in a competitive way, but more selectively, they might pick a city for a variety of reasons. One might be the location of universities nearby so that they can get good talent. Another might be that their suppliers or distributors are economically located so they can get their materials, manufacture, and move products down the line. There's a whole series of private sector reasons as to why someone goes to Downey versus Lakewood versus Long Beach versus downtown LA. But there is one thing in common that they always evaluate, and that is how friendly is City Hall to them? How competitive is the tax rate? So we started to answer that question for our private sector clients on a case-by-case -case basis. And one unfortunate day in the shower, I figured out that we ought to do a survey that does this. And I say unfortunate because it was so much work figuring out how to create a shopping basket of fees and categories of fees. Because like the consumer price index, when you do a comparison of hundreds of cities across the United States, there's no consistency. One city calls a hotel tax one thing, another city calls it another. Business license taxes are computed dozens of different ways throughout the country. So we figured out a series of formulas that allowed us to say to, let's say Fernando, he owns a company, that if I have 10 million in receipts and 100 employees, for business tax, property tax, sales tax, hotel tax, other taxes, I'll pay X dollars in LA versus Y dollars in Santa Monica. And then we rated them, like Zagat's Guide. If you're a $1 city, you're the in and out of cities. If you're a $5 uh, city, you're Bouchon. So at that point, we've now provided the industry with a way to compare how much it costs to invest and do business in a jurisdiction. That's important because when cities like LA have to balance a budget to this day, not only because of Prop 13, but because of a lot of other propositions, they're very limited in where they can raise taxes and revenues. And that means that them being, a city being competitive gives them a better chance to attract investment, to create new jobs and new taxes. So the survey is useful for both the city, uses a mirror, and the private sector to determine where it may want to go. And if it wants to go to a city that's expensive, it might ask that city for an economic development concession to equalize the cost schedule with another city that might be a better deal. And how do you, do you make money on, do you make money on the survey? No, actually we never made money. That's why I say it was an unfortunate idea. <laughs> you know, look, you know, when you're in business, I've been in business 25 years, 30 years, you know, there are good ventures and there are ventures that don't make money. The, the thing that the survey did was bring a level of, of transparency to tax consequences that we had never had in the industry. 
And in order to keep it going, because I didn't want to let it go, rather than have it uh, consume my analytical department, what I did is I gifted it to Claremont McKenna College, to the Rose, to the Rose Institute. And they're able to do the survey and produce it every year and put it out with great consistency. And so the tool is still there. But it's it had a, it's value a, to you as a company because it gave you <coughs> tremendous recognition. I mean, right. a lot of people in, the, in, in that business and in cities know the Cosmon study. In fact, the three guys on this panel wouldn't take my call until I published the survey. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's, uh, it, it, it has been a great... I, I couldn't even spell your name. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, ha it has been a great uh, basis for us to get a reputation for good economic work and those kinds of things. So I'm going to get back to you in a second about redevelopment and all that debate that's going on in the, uh, throughout, throughout the state and what's going to happen with redevelopment agencies. What do you think about uh, Proposition 13 and redevelopment and, and this business survey? Rafe? Tell, um, tell them about the dog. The dog that chased you when you used to, uh, when you campaigned against Prop 13. You're mixing up two stories. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually campaigning in that campaign. Uh, I was helping someone in a state assembly race in a Democratic area of Los Angeles. And our opponent, who won, lied and said that she favored Prop 13 because it was very, very popular in that district. Uh, my candidate did not lie and said that um, she did oppose it. And I would go door to door and I would see signs on the door that said things like Prop 13 or die. <clears throat> I went to the door and I said, I said, I'm campaigning for, and I didn't get the words out before the homeowner said, what's her position on Prop 13? That's all that matters. I said, well, she's opposed and I'd like to explain why. And he threw me out, sent me out into the street with all kinds of imprecations and threats. There's no question, Joel is right, Prop 13 was popular and remains popular. The part of it that's popular, I actually think after all these years I've come to kind of agree with, which is the limit on the rate of the property tax. And, and <laughs> I'm here to tell you it did save a lot of people. That, that happened because you all, ended up buying a house. You for didn't all own property or? or, or just no, for homeowners. I never quite agreed with it applying to commercial property, but I'm here to tell you that the research is pretty clear that it kept a lot of people in their homes. I don't think there's any doubt about that. However, so wait a minute, let me get this clear. You were against Proposition 13 when you were a renter, but now that you're a homeowner, you're for Proposition 13. <laughs> right. Plus I have teenage kids. It's changed in my attitudes about a lot of things. Um, but basically, the two-thirds vote, I think, is a catastrophe. And I think it's both a policy catastrophe and a moral catastrophe for our society. As a new generation of voters enters the California electorate, uh, which is younger, more diverse, more in favor of public services and more activist in government, they are hamstrung by a set of rules that could have been passed by one vote. In other words, Prop 13 could have passed by one vote, and that one vote would bind future generations to require a two-thirds vote. You're saying that it could have passed level. by 50 percent plus one. You didn't need a two-thirds vote to say a two-thirds vote is required to raise taxes. We ought but to have an initiative that says any initiatives that require a two-thirds vote I would, have to pass by two-thirds. I, 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 I don't think any initiative should be able to bind majorities. We have a crisis in this country of genera generational change with a Senate that requires 60 votes to pass anything. A California legislature that requires a two-thirds vote to pass tax increases. <laughs> Local governments required now, because of a new ballot measure that just passed that nobody even noticed, attaching that to fees as well at the state and local level. And here's, here's why I think this is a moral issue. Right now, a lot of people are going to vote against even putting on the ballot in June would voters like to continue the tax increases temporarily of a few years ago. Now, if on the one hand we're told that this is the will of the people to keep tax rates at a certain level, and then we're told secondarily, but the people don't get to weigh in on it because the people might not make the wisest decision about taxes. I've seen mayor after mayor in local cities put measures on the ballot to ask people to raise their property taxes a little bit to hire more police officers and get 64% of the vote and that's a defeat. That means they lost, that they got 64% of the vote. This to me is a travesty, that basically taxes are unpopular. And if elected officials are willing to take a stand, 
to raise the revenue you need to provide services and they can win the support of a majority of the voters. I think it's truly not right in a democracy to then stand in for the people and say, oh, actually what I really meant was two thirds had to support it. Why not three quarters? Why not four fifths? Why not say no taxes can ever be increased? Look, these are basic social decisions. You get what you pay for. I think what people are worried about this year is that the voters are willing to pay more for services. And I think people who don't want it to go on the ballot are worried that the potency of the tax issue will be reduced if the governor gets that on the ballot and the sort of boogeyman of high taxes goes out the window. By the way, there's plenty of evidence, and I'm not nearly as specialist in this as Larry, that businesses do not only consider tax rates in where they locate. There's many other things, but consider the bigger picture. We put cities in a position to compete with each other by the way we allocate the sales tax. So if you get the Costco in your city, that's a great victory for you, even if the traffic spills over to the next city. We make a city like LA, whose job it is to incorporate hundreds of thousands of immigrants who are working class people, we make them compete with Burbank, Santa Monica, and Glendale, and we say, how come you can't make it easier for business to be there? How come you've got to waste all that money on services for which you need to gain revenue? It would seem to me as a society, we ought to be providing services for people to some degree wherever they live so that cities are not in competition with each other. And especially if we're going to ask our biggest cities to handle our toughest problems, we shouldn't throw them out into a pool of sharks of smaller, more affluent cities that can offer a better deal and then say you're not really competitive enough. It's hard to be both competitive and do the work of a big city or else maybe someone else should do that work. Joe, how do you respond to the fact that uh, it should be majority vote, not two-thirds vote? <coughs> Proposition 13 requires two-thirds vote, and that's, some people believe, Rafe included, that that's undemocratic. Well, you know, there are um, <coughs> many times where we as a society have decided to set the rules, and those rules are uh, to, for, for um, making it a supermajority to uh, make important decisions. You can find a two-thirds vote 10 times in the United States Constitution. Um, so uh, uh, the, the two-thirds vote to pass bonds, which are property taxes, uh, bond, local bonds, when they pass a bond, it's not free money. They add a property tax to your bill to build a school, to build a road, whatever, whatever the bond may be for, to build a football stadium downtown. <laughs> I don't, you know, but. Um, that requires a two-thirds vote in California, too. That didn't come with Prop 13. That came with the 1879 Constitution, well over 100 and whatever, 30 years ago, because people didn't want to make it easy to put that debt on future generations. Um, taxes are a form of taking property from people. Not everyone always pays the, the same taxes. Uh, and so a two-thirds vote, in our mind, is justifiable. But let me tell you something, and I'll, I'll, I'll give Rafe this challenge. You want to get rid of the two-thirds vote? It only takes 50% plus one. You put a measure on the ballot, and you change the rules. And it happened recently. Of, uh, how many people followed the election in November with Proposition 25? It was a big debate. Should the budget in Sacramento, the state budget, be passed with a two-thirds vote or a majority vote? That two-thirds vote, by the way, was also not Prop 13. That was the wisdom of an older generation from the 1930s who put a requirement that we have a two-thirds vote to pass the budget. Well, they were hammering at that for a long time, and finally, this November, there was a ballot measure, and the people agreed to lower the two-thirds vote to a majority. Now, I have a suspicion that the reason they did that is because of the other piece of that initiative that was heavily advertised. And that other piece was, anybody remember? Legislators who don't pass the budget on time won't get paid. It was an effort to punish legislators. That's how they painted it. Now, it was put on by legislators. They don't want to punish themselves. But that's how it was painted, to punish legislators. And I had, that had a great influence, I believe, in passing it. But it can pass. So my challenge to Rafe, or to anybody else who feels that you want to get rid of the two-thirds vote for taxes, 
that the voters don't want it, that this new generation of voters that you say are out there that don't want that to their vote, put it on the ballot and see what happens. I have a counter challenge for you. All right. Um, I take that challenge, by the way, um, and I believe that should be on the ballot at some point. I believe it will. I think it may fail the first few times, and I think it eventually it will pass. I believe that Republicans in the legislature should agree to put the governor's plan on the ballot on the same argument, which is let the voters decide if they want to tax themselves. I, I, I do not have the same position that the Republicans in the legislature, legislature do. What I believe is that, yes, let's put those taxes on the ballot, but let's put it on with other reforms. If we're going to let the voters decide about whether they want to tax themselves more, let's also ask them if they want a spending limit, which, by the way, the latest PPIC poll said by 71 percent they did want. Let's ask them if they want pension reform for long-term fiscal health. Let's ask them some other questions. Uh, in my blog, which um, Fernando mentioned, I had an article the other day that I headlined, put it all on the ballot. Let the voters decide. And I'm not resisting putting the taxes on the ballot. If the voters want to extend them, let them decide. But as I pointed out today, maybe the people that you see those polls saying, well, they want to put the plan on the ballot, maybe they want to put the plan on the ballot to vote the taxes down. Because the other part of the PPIC poll was that, do you want to pass income taxes? Do you want to extend income taxes? 70% said no. Do you want to pass sales taxes? 65% said no. So it was a kind of a, a complex, hazy, uh, would you agree, uh, a complex, uh, a, a hazy poll because it said the voters want to see the package on the ballot, but then when each of the taxes were tested, by large majorities, they said no. So, yeah, put them on the ballot. I'm all for that. Let's debate it out, out in front. But let's put those other things, other reforms on the ballot, too, because we're looking for long-term fiscal reform. So taxes obviously impact the budget, impact uh, <laughs> elections, uh, impact everything we do, impact the development of redevelopment agencies that we are now being, seeing challenged. But to kind of see this in a practical matter, uh, something that was uh, talked about in the LA Times today, and it's going to be all over the news tonight and tomorrow as well, is the proposed new NFL football stadium in Los Angeles. And here you have a stadium that's going to be built, and they're going to request certain um, uh, uh, subsidies. certain subsidies from the, the city of Los Angeles. Larry, this is the, exactly the type of project where you are hired to come in by a, the um, owners of the football stadium or owners of a Costco or what have you to help them advise them on, on how to do this. Um, what, what do you, how do you think this is going to, what is, who are the players, not on the field, but <laughs> in terms of this other thing, what are the issues regarding uh, the, uh, the NFL football stadium? I'm not talking about the NFL itself, whether they'll bring a team and all that, but just in terms of the city, in terms of getting this uh, uh, stadium built. Well, the, um, it, this will be a, a, at some level a tax subsidy transaction because it's hard to, to build a $1 billion facility and make it pencil purely privately, especially when the, the basis for that facility is it gets used 11 times a year now. The, the actors in this one are a little bit different, and the questions are, are I think, important. Um, uh, AEG is a remarkable, uh, somewhat unique company because they're a full-service entertainment company, international presence with uh, a network of sports franchises as well as um, entertainment venues throughout the world and throughout the United States. Um, so just, back, to, just to clarify, they own Staples Center. They own, they own Staples the Center. Home Depot Center in uh, Carson. In Carson. They own stadiums in London, Europe, yep, all they, over the place. New I Jersey. Think, right. um, they own soccer teams. So uh, they, they are, uh, they're backed by a, a billionaire industrialist, Phil Anschutz, who seems to have put his uh, stamp of approval on the transaction. And Tim Lywicki is a very creative and persuasive um, CEO, uh, he's the he's the lead point person in this transaction. There's another stadium that is being led by Ed Roski, a, a well-known and well-heeled. Well, well we all know Roski as the dining center, right? Yeah, the I saw the, the yes, uh, exactly. That's the same Roski. Same mm -hmm. Roski. So, but the point is, is that uh, the the proposal by AG is to essentially redo uh, the uh, the convention center hall and. Um, and uh, you know, rebuild a, uh, a football stadium that can act as a multi-purpose arena, uh, 
they can design it that way. I think they can be very effective that way. Uh, they'll ask, they will make the public uh, discussion or announcement that it'll be a privately funded endeavor, but it will need some guarantees in terms of backstop revenues, probably from a hotel tax or a sales tax or a revenue, t a revenue tax in the, um, in the range of about 350 million, I think is the number that's being kicked around. Okay, so what are they asking the city for exactly? They're asking for a uh, guarantee or a contribution of taxes that goes to the remodel of the public space, and it's about $372 million, something and, like and that. And how does that specifically impact the taxpayers of Los Angeles? Well, it, what it does is it dedicates revenue from the co co convention center uh, or tourism pool to that project. It says that for purposes of that project, the city would make a <coughs> affirmative decision in a public hearing to dedicate that revenue and because that revenue is dedicated, then uh, AEG could go finance the stadium uh, or the arena knowing that a portion of it has a city contribution, which even though they'll finance 100% of it, the guarantee for that finance is reduced on their part to the extent that it's made up and provided by the public agency. So let me ask you two questions. Uh, is it going to is the city of LA going to go for this, and are you for it? No, no. I think it's the. I think it's an absolute correct move for um, for the city. Uh, if I were the city, I think you have to hire a team like ourselves, or there's other people that do this, that limit the risk of the city, that limit the exposure of the taxpayer. But here, here are the reasons. You know, whether we like them or not. Uh, cities have to figure out ways to induce private investment. Um, yeah, but it, a football stadium? Did this no, football? no, but, but, but here's, hear, hear me out on this. The private investment that they make, in this case, I think is much, more be, is much beyond a football stadium. I mean, they're, they're retooling an entire district. They're continuing in an ongoing set of improvements to really change the character and nature of downtown Los Angeles. It's a big investment. Um, the difference between, you know, being Memphis and L.A. is significant. It's, it's just huge. And to the extent that L.A. has a center that actually can have enough critical mass of a variety of unique entertainment formats, whether it be sports or the arts, it has a much greater chance over a period of 30 years to attract significant international investment, yeah, which, you, by the way, underwrites taxpayers. But do you add in your survey <laughs> those cultural amenities? Yeah, I, I, look, I don't I add them in the survey because they're impossible to normalize. Nice. And, and also, they're impossible on a geographic area to say that because downtown LA has the football stadium, there's not a benefit to Culver City. I think right. there is. Um, but the reality is, is that you do underwrite or you do recognize when a region has facilities. And um, to the extent that LA has already been the beneficiary of some of AEG's private investment and success, the question it has to ask itself, is it worth taking a billion or a billion two investment and backstopping about 15% of it or 20% of it? To me, as someone who does, the, does these deals all the time, I think that ratio is pretty healthy. I would do that deal, but philosophically, there are a lot of people who just don't want to touch those transactions at all. I'm going to ask Rafe about the politics of this, but before I do, Joel, as the president of the Small Business Action Committee that you currently head, and as the former president of the Howard Jarvis <coughs> Taxpayers Association, what's your position on something like NF, uh, the stadium in the city of Los Angeles? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the specifics as well as Larry does by any means, and um, uh, you know, it, it's always good to. Um, bring in business. Uh, I'm for that because because not only it, it not only affects the major business we're talking about, but there's a ripple effect. Um, uh, other businesses open up around it. So, so uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of the goals of the Small Business Action Committee is try to help create a more business friendly California, and and it gets back into the policy department because I believe a more business friendly California produces the revenue you need to fund the programs that, that, that we, we always are fighting about and, and want to fund. So, um, 
So I, I think that's positive. But I can't speak really to the details of this plan. I don't know what the city's offering. I mean, I, I just heard from Larry here, but I hadn't been following it that closely. So. Yeah. And um, the deal's not done yet. Right. I mean, it's just in the beginning, really. Um, Rafe, I don't want to get into the politics okay. of New York and the NFL, whether right. they're going to get a team or not, uh, but the politics locally, how does that play out in terms of that? And again, I'm not talking about this just because it's football, but here's a concrete example of today, today's news that talks about city <coughs> politics, the finances, and everything that we're talking about here. How do the politics play out on a, a potential stadium downtown? Well, it, it's kind of complicated because there's both excitement about this and a lot of skepticism. And one of the things urban scholarship has told us over the last 20 or 30 years is you've got to be real skeptical about sports stadiums. Now, I say this as a sports fan who would, like, sell my, my birthright mm -hmm. to go to a game and, you know, will immediately think I, Just yeah, I could go to the game, I could take the train down there, I've got all plans. Get elected go. mayor and you can go to the game. Well, there you go. There you go. But the truth of the matter is cities have often sacrificed enormously important things for benefits that turned out to be illusory with sports stadiums. In recent years, sports stadiums have moved back from the suburbs into the cities that they originally said they couldn't invest in because it was better to be in the suburbs. But there's a lot of new stadiums being built in downtowns of cities now. It's turning out to be the best place to build it. So you wouldn't want to underestimate the leverage the city could have in this negotiation, including the possibility that there might be a stadium at the City of Industry. I mean, the city can sometimes stand back and say, well, maybe we're not so sure we want you. But one problem is that this AEG, is it AEG? Yes, AEG. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is a little bit like Disneyland in Anaheim. You know, in Anaheim, Disneyland is very, very powerful. If they sneeze, you know, Anaheim gets a cold. Downtown has struggled for years in Los Angeles to try to become what it wants to become, and AEG has seemed to make a dent in that in kind of an exciting way. But they also have a lot of clout at City Hall, a lot of campaign contributions, a lot of clout with those elected officials and other elected officials who don't like them very much. You have battles between the city attorney, who has taken them on quite a bit, and city council members who get a lot of contributions. Here's my worry. Don't let sports cloud your judgment the way it clouds mine all the time that basically there's a difference between being a sports fan and being a city official a sports fan should be blind and actually for example should think the Lakers are playing well for example you know that's good fan blindness but if you're a city official at a moment when the state government is going to take away your redevelopment program when the whole argument about economic development in the city is under tremendous jeopardy be real careful before you mortgage key assets because the people who have the project can show you a fabulous model and tell you that it's going to create 20,000 jobs a year or something like that. By the way, I think Larry's precisely right that they need to hire people who are independent, which, which I respect about Larry, and they haven't done that yet. They haven't gone out and said, who can tell us the real costs of this I mean, I feel more like Joel in this case. It's like I want to protect the taxpayer right. uh, from getting kind of uh, carried off by the excitement. And I would say one thing about the NFL. I wouldn't put it past the NFL to be using Los Angeles to get the best possible deal from the city to prove that even LA, which refused to put public money into the Olympics in 84 and made it successful, is willing to pony up. So you, Jacksonville, you, Minnesota, had better come up with some money because, look, LA is willing and to refused do it. to put money to football stadiums in the past because they've been trying right. to do that for a long Correct. time. This argument's they been going to, on for yeah, years between for years. LA and the NFL. Yeah. And you don't want to give in so much that the NFL ends up saying, hey, we, we proved that if you wait long enough, even L.A. will kick in. And, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. I, well, I, I actually agree with everything that's being said because um, when I say that the city should entertain this deal, they should. Because um, on the face of it, the way it's being proposed is a pretty good transaction. There's a big difference between Minneapolis putting up their whole general fund or going to a citywide vote for a ticket tax to underwrite a full 900 million dollar stadium that's climate controlled. All right. They need the climate control without a doubt, but the reality is that's a much different proposition and I think that stadiums do not support 
that kind of investment by the public sector. They are basically dogs because they, they run 11 days a year. Different for two reasons here and why it's worth the discussion. Because I don't know what the right answer is. If they hired me, I'd try and figure it out, but they're gonna hire someone to do it. And I hope that that person or that firm is qualified because the reality is AEG has started from a platform that says, I'm gonna do th two things. I wanna, fi I wanna bring a stadium and fix the convention hall. Number two, I don't want you underwrite or pay for the whole thing. I need about 20% of the cost. <coughs> Number three, I really need a guarantee. I'm gonna fund it up front. So to me, they have, if I were working for them on that project, which I'm not, I would have proposed it pretty much the same way because I, I think they start from a rational perspective of public subsidy. Still doesn't mean that it's a good deal for us as a taxpayer, but it's a good question they've asked and it's a good location to ask the question for. The other comment that's absolutely right, because I've made presentations to, to the NFL on behalf of companies trying to entice the NFL here to different sites in prior years, the NFL likes one thing, to make a profit. And they would love to see some level of public investment, and they will play our jurisdiction, LA, off of others for that purpose. So double reason to be very scrutinous about this proposal about the NFL, but it is a fair assessment. It's a legitimate question for LA, and if it, if it could be done the right way, it may be a good, a good bet. And just to support what Rafe said about how Disney controls <coughs> when things go down, when you drive to Disneyland down the five freeway and you cross into Orange <laughs> County, what happens? All of a sudden you go from two lanes to five lanes. Right. That's Disney's <laughs> That's right. doing. That's right. Disney yep. created that. Happiest place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one comment. Uh, is, is it my understanding that AEG is proposing almost the very same structure that led to the development of Staples Center? And that's been successful. And so is it, is it very similar? You, you know, I, I haven't seen it, but the Staples Center um, used a uh, TOT, the T Transit Occupancy Tax Fund. I, I thought think it was a ticket tax. As a, as a, no, as a support for a special assessment tax that they placed on themselves. Right. So that's how they did that. I think this deal is a little different. I just haven't seen it, but it's, it, you know, th this would be, you know, a kind of archaic discussion for this group, but there are ways to slice okay. this up, and I just haven't seen whether or not this structure is the same or slightly different. Right. Well. California, of the three oldest stadiums in the NFL, there are 32 stadiums. The three oldest are in California, San Diego, Qualcomm, right. the uh, San Francisco <coughs> right. um, Candlestick Park, I guess, and then uh, um, Alameda County where the, the Raiders play, which we don't typically identify California with the oldest structures, but in, in, in sports they tend to be. Dodger Stadium, I think now, is the third oldest stadium in Major League Baseball. Um, and by the way, why do we need professional football? We have the USC Trojans. They get paid to play. <laughs> um, one, one more thing, redevelopment. I just need Larry for you to uh, talk a little bit and explain to the students what redevelopment is and why it's facing potential extin extinction and what that might mean for cities. And then I want to talk a little bit about the future in terms of the mayor's race, uh, the potential mayor's race, who's been thinking about doing that. And then I'm going to open it up to the students to ask questions because I know they're dying to ask questions. Um, so the students can start getting ready to ask questions as soon as I finished uh, with these two points and then you guys can ask the questions. Okay. So uh, at redevelopment. The very, at the very base of it, what redevelopment means is that a city is allowed, um, a city or a county is allowed under the uh, under the uh, state um, uh, legislative uh, uh, process to uh, create to study an area, declare it blighted, which uh, has its own set of definitional uh, platforms. Blighted means it's. But it means that it's underperforming in some way. It could be socially underperforming in terms of crime. It could be economically underperforming in terms of uh, private investment, tax generation, so sometimes level they call of unemployment. That a, a slum or a commercial strip that's just, there's no business. Right, right. right. The, you know, uh, and the definition of blight has changed over the years. But in general, it's some definition, it's some determination that an area is underperforming. And as a consequence, you can put a, a line around the map, call it a project area, 
approve a redevelopment plan through a series of public hearings, <clears throat> including an environmental approval. And once that project area is adopted, I'm, and I'm greatly simplifying the process, but the year that that project area is adopted becomes the base year upon which the taxes that were collected and funneled to all the underlying tax districts, schools, special districts, and city, get frozen. And from that point on, any additional dollar of property tax, the additional 2% from Prop 13 for property, any new tax that comes on goes to that new, cre newly created redevelopment agency that manages the project area. So if there were a million dollars of taxes being distributed in 1995 in a certain area, and the project area was adopted in 1996, every new dollar would go to the project area. With that new dollar, or let's say new million dollars that would come in in the next year, the people that run that, City Hall that runs that project area, the redevelopment agency specifically, can take that money and essentially sell, it's called tax increment, and they can leverage it. They can sell it in the public mar marketplace on a ratio of about eight or nine to one, maybe more at some times, depending, depending on prevailing interest rates. And they can take that money and invest it in a number of real estate oriented activities. So in a nutshell, redevelopment is a way to do two things. Create an area that generates a new tax base for which that tax base can be used as a vehicle to create indebtedness and that indebtedness can be spent on new projects which ostensibly create jobs and taxes and are meant to resolve or improve or renovate and eliminate the blight which was the reason you started redevelopment in the first place. It's a great story at that level. Here's the problem. It's complicated. Wait, wait, a great story at that level. So it's going to be on the midterm. Right. Okay. So basically, <clears throat> redevelopment is the creation of a new government that will collect taxes and invest in the development of that region through businesses, real estate, et cetera. Yeah, businesses, real estate, it can acquire and relocate property, it can invest. But it is a new government in a sense. It is a new government. It is a separately incorporated entity under the Health and Safety Code. Very often, the people that sit on the redevelopment agency board are the same as the city council, but they are, it's, it's like when not in Los Angeles. But not in Los Angeles. But for the most part, uh, in all, there's 975 project areas in California. 970 or so have the same players managing the city as they do the, uh, the redevelopment agency. You were going to say that there's a problem. Well, the problem is that uh, it, is a, it, it is a very robust level of, of tax uh, of tax generation and so it's a powerful financing tool and it can be sophisticated because you can get a whole bunch of people like myself and investment bankers who can convince cities to drive up debt related to redevelopment because redevelopment is a creature of debt to the extent that you have new increment you can't use it unless you borrow against it so you leverage and you go into debt to spend money on projects Sounds terrible, but it's not. It's very inexpensive debt, and if you do it the right way, and that's the trouble, if you do it the right way, you can really change areas. Pasadena, yeah. So can give turn us around. give us examples of some very yeah, successful Bur downtown Burbank. I was the redevelopment director of downtown Burbank. We invested a hundred million dollars, and look at how it's going there. We had we had no movies, we had no restaurants. You know, we reopened San Fernando Road. We put in a mall. We put in IKEA. A lot of things in Burbank over the years, when I was there and after I left, were very successful applications of using tax increment leverage to bring in private investment. When it's done well, you bring in a lot more private investment than, than you create public debt. When it's done poorly, what happens is uh, cities can divert that money for things like staff or other uses that weren't really that envisioned. What's an example of where it's been done poorly? Well, like, you know, Bell, Bell. is a great example, okay? Of, That's of an easy boogeyman, everybody, okay, no. what, another, about, what about no, another one? But I mean, there are other cities in the, that as taxes have dwindled, 
from your normal sources like sales tax and so on, more and more cities say, look, I need to pay for that redevelopment planner by using redevelopment money. I'm not saying that's incorrect. I think that's okay. It's really okay, though, if the objectives of the agency, if the investments of the agency are done skillfully, and if there's a return on the taxpayer's investment. And there are lots of success stories. Unfortunately, there are some, success, there are some stories that haven't been successful, where agencies have been obligated to put, put in hundreds of units of affordable housing, and they've done nothing. And that really puts a black eye on the industry. But here is the bottom line for me. I, if you told me, uh, you know, Governor Brown, if you tell me that you can convince the people in the legislature to take away redevelopment, and you could also convince me that there are a lot of other compelling economic development tools out there to normalize California's capacity to overcharge business and make it a difficult place for private sector to make investments in, I'd say fine. If I have other tools, then maybe modify this one. The truth is, is there are no other tools. There are no real other tools for economic development. So if you take redevelopment away, you really put cities in a tough spot in terms of really enabling them to allow their local economies to flourish and to have some local control over attracting private investment in a significant way. And I think that's a loser for the state. So I'd hate to see it. I think once the state makes a decision, if they do, to take the $6 billion a year in tax increment that comes from those redevelopment agencies away from redevelopment and give it to the state for other services, we will never see lower cost leverageable dollars that can be invested in new industry and in new jobs. Six billion dollars a year, that's a lot of money. A that's lot of money. Well, well, no, it's not all, not all of it because he's going <laughs> to, what Governor Brown's proposing is to leave whatever is necessary to pay off the bonds and the debt. Sure. So but he'll get he, there eventually. Eventually. But what he's talking about now is his position is that he'll have about a little less than two billion dollars currently um, right. to, to uh, go to schools, cities, those entities that currently use the property tax. And if that property tax, uh, which is not now being, which would no longer be uh, the leverage that Larry talked about in the redevelopment agencies, if it was going to these other entities, then there's no backfill required from the state, and then the state has filled up a $2 billion hole in its $28 billion that, deficit. That, now, there is, there is one, uh, just one last point. Sure. To Larry, Larry says there's no other devices. The governor has proposed a device. He has suggested, and we're going to come full circle here, he has suggested that economic development taxes be increased by a 55% vote, not a two-thirds. That's in the budget package, but he's, it's a long-term proposal. Are you for proposal. that? No. No? Okay. Hey, um, I, I know the students are I could just tell the students are dying to come up here and ask questions. But, so we're going to talk about one more thing, and that's uh, the mayoralty and why anybody wants to be mayor. Um, we talked about, in your introduction, you talked about the mayor of New York, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who's a multi-billionaire. Um, in New York, the mayor can appoint the superintendent of education. In Los Angeles, the mayor of Los Angeles has absolutely no power over LA Unified or any of its uh, uh, activities. Uh, in New York, the mayor can impact, uh, significantly impact transportation. In Los Angeles, the mayor is just one of 13 members of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And I can go on and on about the weakness, the formal weakness of the mayor of Los Angeles. He has very little substantive power when compared to the mayor of New York or the mayor of Chicago. Uh, but he's got a lot of symbolic power that you, that you talked about. Um, why does anybody want to be mayor of Los Angeles given the weakness that it has? You basically can't do much. Well, first of all, I think the weakness has always been overstated. Uh, mayor Richard Reardon used to overstate this routinely that he had no power whatsoever. It, it, you know, in charter terms, the mayor is a moderately strong mayor, and New York and Chicago are living gods uh, in, in charter terms. But you know what? Politics in California is more horizontal, and politics on the East Coast where I grew up is more vertical. You get to tell people what to do, and you can get kind of used to that. But I'm not sure that's the only way to exercise power. 
to be successful as mayor of New York, of LA, you need to learn how to negotiate. You have to build coalitions. You've got to work with people. You've got to form strong alliances. If the mayor wants to control the school board in March, he needs to win an election for school board so that his allies get elected, and he's sort of ahead in that right now. That's what he did in the previous election. Uh, Tom Bradley built one of the great coalitions in the history of, of urban government and ended up with a considerable amount of authority. There's no shortage of people who want to be mayor of Los Angeles. I will tell you this, it's very difficult to get elected, though, because it's okay to have the support of your own group, but no single group is enough to win an election for Los Angeles. You do need uh, extra support. The election that's coming up in March is the first opening shot in but Hold on. That How many election. of you knew that there was an election in March in the city of Los Angeles? That's about the number of people we expect to turn out to vote <laughs> in the election. Exactly right. Turnout is very low in L.A. elections anyway, being nonpartisan, off-year elections. But this will be particularly low. But there's a lot of significance in this election. For one thing, control the school board is at stake. That's the most important thing. So it's the mayor against his old friends in the teachers' union. They're sort of now pitted against each other. Um, the other thing is if you look at the ballot measures, they're all actually, as it turns out, relatively non-controversial. The big battle was which ones would go on the ballot. The real significance of those measures is each of them is associated with someone who wants to run for mayor. And in a city like L.A., you've got to find a way to make your mark. There's no political party to elevate you or anything like that. So Eric Garcetti has a proposal. Jan Perry has a proposal. Tom LaBonge has a proposal. So they'll be known for their proposals. This goes on everywhere. Arnold Schwarzenegger became well-known because of his was the, the after school, the after after school, school program, ballot yeah. measure that was associated with him. Is sort of how he came in there. That happened after he played kindergarten cop and he knew that. Uh, uh, yes, that's, right. that's exactly. After he was told he needed to soften his image a little bit, they filmed him in kindergarten cop. John Vandekamp, when he ran for governor in 1990, had three initiatives on the ballot. Right. Backfired on him. He didn't get a nomination. <laughs> so, but, okay, let's explain. Who, so people want to be mayor. Who, who are the players? You mentioned Jan Perry, Eric Garcetti, Tom LaBanche, all council members. All council members. Uh, the other people, probably one of the leading candidates is Wendy Gruel, former council member, now city controller. Simple rule in L.A., if you've been elected citywide already, you're in a better position than someone who's only been elected to council. Uh, and the other two officers are city attorney, city controller, and mayor. The city attorney apparently wants to become district attorney and basically throw everybody in Los Angeles in jail is my, is my basic view. So he might not want to waste time being mayor because the mayor can't actually indict anybody. Uh, but other than that, the other, one of the other sleeper candidates is County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky. Now why, do you, uh, why do you call him a sleeper? Well, actually, he's, the mo he's reenacted the modern version of the Shakespearean character Hamlet, uh, which is every four years, feelers go out that, that Zev Yaroslavsky is running. This, I think, went back to the, I think the 1850s Tom was yeah. the first time. He uh, done it he'd be a before. very formidable candidate, and I actually think this might be the year yeah. he actually does it, but I'm not going to bet anything on it because he always talks about running. This might be the year he really <coughs> runs. Uh, he and Wendy Gruel would be competing over the same base of support, which is the west side and the San Fernando Valley. Uh, there'll be some marginal candidates uh, who will all sort of fight. Eric Garcetti is a serious potential candidate. Um, then there's the outsiders, members of Congress might run, state legislators. So all the people who say it's not an attractive office, where do you see how many people line up? The reason they won't run, by the way, is not because they don't want the job, but because they don't think they can win. Because they can't raise enough money, and they don't think they can win citywide. It's really tough to win citywide in L.A. Joel, what does it take to win? And who would your organization be willing to support of those names that uh, Rafe mentioned? Well, one name that uh, you didn't mention, um, and we don't know if he's going to run or not, but he likes to throw his name out there, is Rick Caruso. Oh, I'm sorry. And, I would have put and, Rick in the, in the list for and, sure. And, yeah. and, and what makes him interesting is, number one, he's a Republican. Oh, God. And number two, he's a rich developer. So um, uh, we, we've seen the rich Republican try to win public office before. Yes, we have. We saw it very recently, in fact. Yes. But we also had a successful one in Los Angeles. Uh, Richard Reardon mm -hmm. was a Republican and a businessman. And um, Fernando and I were talking in the office earlier. He doesn't think the times are the same, and you'll, you'll probably get into that. Um, but 
he has money and he can sell fun. So that can bring some attention to him. It doesn't mean he's going to win. I don't know. I you know but but, but, he, but he, he becomes a player in the race. And if there are so many candidates, and we, we just heard the list, there's going, there could be eight candidates, then you don't need as many votes to win. And everyone's going to consider that as part of their strategy. Uh, so uh, I think it really is wide open. And you could be surprised by who will come in and, and take it. I know Rafe is going to continue this conversation, but I want to ask any student who has a question to come up here to the mic, and we'll start getting you lined up, and uh, so you can ask the question. And uh, uh, all three, four professors are watching as to who's going to come up and giving extra credit, thinking highly of you, et cetera. So um, you, you had very quick, just so you all know, because it's basic info. In LA, in the primary, all the candidates run. And if nobody gets more than 50% of the vote, there's a runoff of the top two. Now, what that means, and Joel's exactly right, if you get 25 to 30% of the vote, you're pretty much guaranteed a spot in the runoff. Um, so that's what you're really trying to do. But I have one more candidate to throw in. I'll give you a clue. <clears throat> he's the best politician in Los Angeles, but he's never held public office. This is like a riddle, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, he'd be the tallest of all the candidates. Oh, that's He's easy, well that. known as a business entrepreneur, maybe the most successful entrepreneur in the city. He had a press conference today. He was and he had a press conference today about the stadium the today, about stadium. farmers. Yeah. And did, does he wear, did he used to wear number 32? He used to wear number 32. His name's Irvin Magic Johnson. And according to every study I've seen, his is the single most valuable political endorsement in Los Angeles politics. And I know he'd love to be mayor because when he supported Jim Hahn for mayor, after Hahn won on election night, Magic introduced him and said, if he doesn't do a good job, I'll run against him myself, <laughs> uh, which he didn't do. I think, by the way, Magic Johnson would be a very hard candidate to defeat if he decided to run. The, so, mayor, the mayor of Sacramento uh, right now is Kevin Johnson, who is the former National Basketball Association. And Magic could take him. I'm convinced one-on-one. -on -one, one-on-one, uh, on one he would be him easily. <laughs> oh, Dominic, you have a question? Um, I want to address to, uh, first, tell us your name and who your favorite professor is. My name is Dominic Bell. Uh, I am in uh, politics in Los Angeles class with uh, Dr. Guerra, and I would like to address the question to Mr. Sonenshine. Um, in light uh, of what we've been discussing, or you, the panel has been discussing about the demonization of Proposition 13, um, if we take Recently, New Jersey elected a new governor. And uh, prior to his be being governor, uh, I have been informed that New Jersey had the highest uh, tax levels in the entire country, both property and other taxes. And as a result of that, there was a mass exodus of businesses uh, as well as homeowners who were practically very wealthy, um, which I know nothing about, uh, but they left. And uh, not only from there, but also from New York. Uh, and as a result of him coming in, now that he has come in, he's lowered some of the taxes, changed some of the proposals dealing with teachers unions and the like. Businesses have come back. Uh, many of the homeowners that are very wealthy are coming back. At least that's what's been reported. So my question to you is, in light of that and uh, seeing that him lowering taxes and that you know the situation economically has improved somewhat, I mean, I don't know how drastically, but it has improved somewhat, is Prop, uh, Prop 13 really the problem, or is the uh, repealing of it the holy grail to our problems, or is it really an issue about how much we are spending uh, here in the state of California? Wow. Okay, that's a complicated question. You're talking about Chris Christie, yes. uh, the new governor of uh, New Jersey, the state I grew up in. Now, I know that according to Governor Christie, things are much better in New Jersey since he's come in. Uh, I'm not sure what the data is on that. I have a lot of relatives back there, and I doubt the state has turned around that dramatically in such a short time. He's only been in a short time. I do know that he canceled the single largest economic development project in the history of New Jersey, which was nearly ready to go, just waiting for New Jersey to sign on, which is to build a new route through the Lincoln Tunnel that I used to drive through as a kid, which is in desperate need of renovation and would create tens of thousands of jobs. And he unilaterally canceled that project, which is going to cost thousands of jobs to residents of New Jersey. But I say that only as a sidelight. Uh, 
Actually, I, I believe that that's consistent with my argument. Let's say that lowering taxes was a better way to go. Okay, let's say that was the right answer. That's why we have elections. And it, even if it turns out that the results you're describing are correct, those would be the result of an election in which the majority said, let's elect someone who will lower taxes. I actually have no problem with that at all. If you elect someone who raises taxes, uh, you know, Bill Clinton raised taxes and there was a huge boom in prosperity after that. Some Ronald Reagan lowered taxes and there was a big boom in prosperity after that. Again, that's politics. What I object to is building an artificial barrier into the system that says no matter who's elected, here's what the taxes will be. So I say you can make a great case, elect me, I will lower taxes and the following things will happen and if it doesn't work, I'll throw you out of office. That, that's what elections are for. So we're probably not on the opposing side, except I'm not a big fan of Governor Christie, I have to tell you, because I want, I want a nicer Lincoln Tunnel that I can drive through. Thank you. Um, we're going to end this with one final question to each of our panelists, and this will be their, they can answer their question and kind of wrap up on their own. The first question is going to be to um, Joel Fox. Will there be an initiative in this year, in the June ballot or in the November ballot, to extend or maintain the current taxes on the ballot, and will it pass? And to Mr. Ray Schonenschein, how will Antonio Villaragosa be seen as a mayor four or five years from now? Um, I predict that Governor Brown will be successful in getting the tax, calling a special election, getting the tax measure on the ballot. It may not be in the conventional way. He may not get those Republican <coughs> votes, but he may be able to go through a back door. There's some debate whether there's a constitutional avenue with a simple majority vote to put it on the ballot. I think he'll get it. I think they'll be on the ballot. Um, I can't tell you whether it's going to pass or not. I think what we're going to, one of the reasons the Republicans are resisting, by the way, uh, at least this is what I hear, um, is, is not so much that they're afraid of, uh, that people have changed their mind. What they fear is that the spending on the yes side will be overwhelming uh, because the unions will all chip in for these tax increases. Uh, and there will be very little spending on the no side. The taxpayer groups will only come up with a, you know, a few bucks. Uh, the business community is the key. The governor is going to try to neutralize the business community and either have them donate to the yes side or at least keep them out. Uh, he'll probably be successful in doing that. So the concern is if there's a lot of money on one side, might the historic <coughs> anti-tax sentiment in California be defeated in, in this instance. And by the way, the, that anti-tax sentiment is particularly on the state level because, uh, and you may have statistics on this, Rafe, but uh, if you look, um, a great majority of local taxes are passed by the voters, even with a two-thirds vote. Um, but it's that they don't trust the legislature and the governor with their money. And the last six taxes on the ballot were defeated. There was, if you recall, in November, there was a simple $18 tax on your vehicle for parks. Who would be against that? There was no campaign against it. There was a campaign for it. It was defeated. So the odds, uh, the, the anti-tax sentiment is still very strong. And the question is, how much money will it be spent on one side? I, I uh, was at a press conference that one of the taxpayers groups were putting on. And they said that they were so confident they were going to win, uh, even if they were outspent 10 to 1. And after the press conference, the fellow who said that, <coughs> I went up to him and I said, I want to make sure I heard that right because I was writing my little blog. I said, you're going to win if you're outspent 10 to 1? He says, that's what I said. But I didn't say we're going to win if we're outspent 30 to 1. And that's what they were afraid of. <coughs> hey, um, Antonio Vida Gosta, are we going to miss him in four years, wish he was back, or are we going to forget how to even spell his name? <laughs> Presuming people spelled his name correctly the first time. I think he'll actually, we'll know something about how he'll be remembered when we see how people campaign for mayor in 2013. Uh, they could campaign by saying we're going to go in a totally different direction. That'll tell you something. My guess is it'll be a little bit like Bill Clinton, which is actually that they will favor the continuation of his policies, but offer to be a somewhat different kind of person. Uh, sort of the argument that Al Gore wanted to make in 2000, in effect. That in other words, I think his personality has been kind of a mixed bag for people. And I think the other candidates will say, I'm not, you know, I'm not flighty. I, uh, you know, I'm not going to be the most charismatic person in the world. I'm, but at the end of the day, they'll probably say 10,000 police officers. If the 3010 thing goes through, he'll be a hero. 
so it'll be on substantive grounds, I think he'll be seen very well. I think there will be a desire to be in some odd way a less powerful mayor because Viragosa used the new city charter more than anybody really did to sort of get his way with the mm -hmm. city council. I think the next mayor will be probably a little less likely to be seen as a power mayor. So I think there'll be a separation between I succeed him as a personality, I'll be different, but at the end of the day, I think his policies are gonna hold up. Okay, I wanna remind the students that there are some sign up sheets for your class if you're attending are here because of one of those classes out on there. And let's give our three guests a warm Loyola Marymount thank you.